We are going okay. to start now. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Please, yes, yeah. On your video. Yeah. Okay, we are going to start the session. I'm Mutikala Subba, the one from Nelta. Dear presenters of today, Ms. Kasa, Holist, and Mr. Padam Chowan, all the Nelta and BC's organizing team, wonderful teacher participants, namaskar and good afternoon to all. Once again, we are here for the final webinar session of June. I would like to welcome you all in the today's webinar session on teaching receptive skills in remote settings, organized by the British Council and Nelta. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's two dynamic presenters. Ms. Casa Holises is a teacher trainer and a Cambridge assessor. She holds an MA in English Philology and is a CELTA Delta qualified teacher. She has been teaching in the EFL sector for the last 20 years and developing training teachers for 13 years. Ms. Holis travels extensively as an educational trainer and assessor. She has worked in Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Her main interest lay in the fields of motivation and mindfulness in teaching learning. She is currently based in Italy. Prior to that, she was the director of studies and head of teacher training in one of educational establishments in London. Uh, I think the background noise is there. Somebody is there. Please switch off. Uh, yeah. Mute your microphone. It's important to conduct research. Mr. Padam Chowan works as a writing consultant in Minnesota State University, MSU, Mankato, USA. Mr. Chowan has earned MA in English Education from Tribhuvan University, Nepal, and MA in Tishol from MSU, Mankato, USA. He is pursuing Doctor of Education degree in Educational Leadership at MSU. Prior to that, he has taught EFL courses to high school and undergraduate students and also served as a high school principal in Nepal. Mr. Chowan has voluntarily served Nelta as the position of treasurer 2011 to 2015 and as a general secretary 2015 to 2016. He has presented papers at many national and international conferences like Nelta, ITFL, Tishol, TSL, UK, USA and Canada. Welcome Casa Holis and Padam Chowan. Now over to you. You can start your session. All the best. We are here for any kind of support it's over to you thank you thank you very finish. much <laughs> thank you very much and welcome everyone um, in a second we'll start sharing our screen and hopefully you'll be able um, to see the screen um, yes once again welcome to the Nelta series on developing teachers our webinar today is going to focus on teaching receptive skills in remote settings. I'll start the presentation and then I'll hand over to my lovely um, co-presenter. Um, the recording of the webinar received um, a possible yes, work on Saturdays in Nepal, so tomorrow probably, and the certificate as well, uh, you'll receive an email tomorrow with the link. And we would really, really appreciate your feedback, um, constructive feedback, so we know how we can improve and make these uh, webinars um, even better. A couple of housekeeping rules. It'd be great if you could keep yourself on mute throughout the session so that there are no noises that can be potentially disruptive for the others. Also, to preserve the bandwidth, if you could please switch off your video during the presentation. We would all love to see there is a limited participant, and if you can um, switch off your video. If there are um, any questions, um, you'll be able to ask the questions using the chat box. 
Um, and we will have 10 minutes um, by the end of the webinar to answer any questions you might have. And if there is something uh, if you use the rest of your hand button, that would be great to let us know there's, there's something going on. Right, okay. So let's start with the objectives of the webinar. So the idea is that you're going to become familiar with the similarities and differences between teaching receptive skills in a face-to-face -face setting in a setting. And that will tell you, it will help you understand some and give you some practical ideas for teaching receptive skills in um, those remote settings. So welcome again and enjoy this webinar. So as we know, receptive skills in any language, and it's, it's English or any language, is and the aim of any teacher, an English language teacher, is to develop these skills in the classroom environment but also to provide students with all the necessary techniques and tools so they can be practicing these skills outside the classroom. We all know that our responsibility is within the classroom, but we should also encourage something that we call learner autonomy. So what we want is we want our students to take responsibility for their own learning outside the classroom with the tools and techniques they can do it. So reading and listening. And obviously, we need to read in our language. These would be books, um, documents, newspapers. Everybody now has a mobile device, so we read their signs. So students of English need to be able to read all of these things in English too. So we've got reading, we've got listening which is a vital skill in any language. It's part communication. When we listen, we understand others, we interpret what they're saying, and we're able to participate in communication. But not only this. Um, listening helps our students acquire new words, new language, um, language chunks, grammar, pronunciation, we need to make sure that we deliver lessons that focus on giving practice in these skills and that we develop these skills. Um, the question is, is it very different? It is different. Teaching receptive skills online is di different from this environment, but it doesn't mean that it's less when we were in class with our students, it might feel easier because we're there, we're next to them. We can see what's happening. They've got the course book, they've got the materials, they've got the handouts, but we can easily adapt what we have each reading and learning successfully in the remote environment, especially that in the current situation, where in many contexts, teaching and learning is moving into the online setting, we as teachers need to become confident, how can I do it effectively, so that um, our students can learn, grow and develop. So that's progress. Know that we can everything in a digital version nowadays. Even if we have a newspaper, we can take a photo of it and have it ready for an online setting. With many video conferencing platforms, such as Zoom, Appearian, and Skype, they all have other screen sharing features, which are used in less my teams as well. Um, with Zoom in particular, um, students can use the drawing tool for annotations on screen which is especially useful when skimming or scanning a text. This is when you are sharing a text. What you also do is have from the materials that you have as an editable, shareable Google document, 
share the link with your students and then again they can be annotating things there. Um, as I mentioned, um, teachers and students, we can take screenshots of reading materials, we can save it as PDF and eggs, we can save a very popular nowadays Google Drive folder or, or Dropbox. In this way, our students, um, we can help them stay organized, but also we protect the environment at the same time. We as teachers waste a lot of paper. We know this. There are always hundreds of handouts, paper, slippers, a remote payment. We can all keep it in one place. Listening. Listening can be easily and should be actually integrated with productive skills. We need, however, to have the right equipment. Um, we need to make sure that our students can listen to the audio files that they can listen to the videos and they can learn the uh, At the beginning of the webinar, you experience some background noise and obviously it's disruptive. So we need to make sure that our students can hear the sound clearly. On Zoom, for example, the computer audio can be shared. Um, you need to enable this function settings and students to listen to the sound in a very clear version. Obviously, earphones are uh, recommended to muffle any outside noise. Now that we're all staying um, in our households um, and there are other members of the family, um, there, there can be a lot of noise coming from outside. It's better to have earphones and students complete tasks. It is recommended that either you as a teacher uh, mute them or they themselves mute themselves to, again, minimize the risk of any disruptions. All listening tasks can be carried out online. You can do pre-listening. You can do watching a video, listening to an audio file. There are host tasks. We have deep techniques with, help of oil, with the help of technology that we've got. So we can use whiteboards, we can use chat boxes, we can share resources on screen, and we can play, replay, pause the recording as many times as necessary. So as you can see, uh, um, it can be easily done remote, and it doesn't really differ from doing it face to face. If we have a quick look at um, what those basic receptive sub-skills are, we've got reading for gist, which we call skimming, or listening for gist, where we give our students an opportunity to um, read and cover it. This is what we do in real life, don't we? We have a look at an article, quick look, okay, it's interesting, I want to read more, or I'm not really interested in this. The same happens with listening. We'll play the recording and we would like our students to get an overall idea of whatever they're listening to. We encourage students, especially when reading, to read it quickly, not to worry about any words that might be difficult or that might be potentially blocking their understanding of the text. The second reading, um, which we call scanning, or the second listening, which it could be listening for specific information, it's where our students scan the text for relevant information. There might be for a number or a place or a name. They're quickly jumping through the text with their eyes to find the information. When it comes to listening, they are listening to the, to the file that you're playing in order to hear those pieces of information. Um, another set of sub-skills that we can develop is reading or listening for deep and mean that was a little bit more to um, have them go a little bit deeper and we want them to answer slightly more questions. So, for example, what um, did the, why did the author or speaker feel that way? They need to be a little bit more focused and these tasks take a little bit more time. Therefore, we recommend 
reading for detail or listening for detail, but mostly reading for detail, that it's done at home, not necessarily in the online setting. When we think about a basic um, receptive skills procedure, obviously it's crucial that we start um, around interest to set scene. We need to contextualize our lessons. We want it to be memorable. If um, whatever we do, both in the same way, in the remote setting or face-to-face -face setting, whatever we do is engaging from the moment we got them. We have our students glued to the screen. Um, so that's very important. The memorable. Obviously, we're teaching um, any words necessary for our tasks. So remember that we do not focus on all the unknown words. Um, classes sometimes are quite big. We'll have 20, maybe sometimes 30 students. It's impossible to teach every single word that they might not. Or definitely that might stop students from completing the task and focus on pre-teaching these so that we make the tasks more manageable. We would set an easy reading or listening tasks before, and that, that's usually just. Make that when tasks very, very clear. When in the face-to-face -face setting, we have our students in front of us, we see, we can read their body language, we feel the energy in the room. In the online setting, we don't have that luxury. So we have to make sure that students are with us every step of the way. We have to make sure that we set these tasks very, very, very to check. We will be displaying the text or playing the audio or video where learners read and read, listen for the first time. Um, we're in the online setting, if you share your screen and you want them to focus on a particular bit of the text, you can do it. Then obviously it's extremely important that the learners check their answers first. They need to grow in for feedback with us. We're setting a second task, which requires more detailed reading or listening. And this could be, um, as you remember, reading or listening for specific information, or perhaps if you decide to do it, it can be reading or listening for detail, where they really need to go in depth. You need to make sure it gives us a little bit of time to look at the questions before they um, read or listen again. Okay? This is very important, that time for preparation, so that they know what they're looking for in the text. We play um, the recording again, or we ask them to read again. They monitor. And now we monitor in the online setting. Well, we know that in class we could be very close to our students if need be. However, sometimes we would be stepping up, stepping back and monitoring them in an unobtrusive way. In the online setting, you're always there. But there's nothing stopping you from switching video. Students are distracted appearance. For example, they're working in separate rooms because the video conferencing platforms now allow you to group students into different rooms. You can swap between the rooms to see what you're doing. So we're still monitoring. Then if we notice any difficulties, we section of um, and then pair checks feedback. The final stage would be the follow-up work. Well, very often in a purely receptive skills lesson, we would want to develop our students' productive skills. And productive skills would be speaking and writing. Speaking where it's the students that are okay. And this is life something interesting, we watch something interesting, we hear an interesting piece of news and we want to share with others. We're all herd creatures. We want to talk to others. This is what we do in class as well. The question is then, how do online reading or listening lessons really differ 
uh, phase two. Well, the structure is the same. We've just seen the structure of the lesson. The key difference here is whether the reading is done in the lesson or for homework. Because nowadays, we might be emailing uh, materials to our students um, and telling them, can you read it for tomorrow's lesson? Whether it's done in a lesson at home, this will depend on your learner's age, the text type and task. Now, many of you are probably um, involved in the primary sector, primary school sector, so younger learners, and they are more likely to read text in the lesson. Simply because adult or learners, learners are capable of reading independently. Again, this depends on the task, text type and your tasks. Um, and that's what I mentioned, the detailed reading is recommended for homework. This is where your students need more time. And as we know, if you've got experience teaching online, we know that things take a lot. The detail, some of you might be preparing um, students for exams, and, and you know that, for example, an IELTS reading exam, there are three lengthy academic texts. There's no time for them to read it in a lesson. So what we tell them to do is read it at home. And when for the next lesson, we can their understanding, follow up work or exam attack skills. Um, however, in um, sort of real time, it's really, really good to practice scanning skills because you're in control of students. Yet. If you turn your screen and you are pointing them to a certain, a certain paragraph, this is where you're helping them. So this is recommended for um, classwork, um, online work real-time work, if you like. Um, audio files, but also audio files can be sent to students via chat boxes. A lot of the platforms have the, the option of a chat box, or they can be emailed to students for further autonomous study. We want our students to be doing the work outside the classroom as well, and we're giving them the tools. Uh, provide tape scripts, for extra they struggle with listening and very often students do struggle with listening for a lot of reasons um, a lot of phonological aspects give them the audio file give them the tape script and they can do the work um, receptive skills especially when it comes to reading when we are sharing screens we all have certain strengths and weaknesses. We can decide to use the whiteboard as a feature of many platforms or a separate um, software. There are a lot of whiteboards available um, in free versions just as a um, link. And then you can display things very, very quickly. And all learners can see what you want to see. Just right now, uh, I want you to see, and that is my However, um, we can only show it for a very short time. And the short, sorry, short text. Uh, if we want to show longer text, they'll be too small to see for our learners. And they can't see the text after the lesson has ended or after you sharing this. Um, again, with screen sharing, so not only the whiteboard, but with screen sharing, you have complete control over what students can see. However, as we know, not everybody's reading speed is the same. So relying on students reading at the same pace when you are scrolling down, in charge, so you're scrolling down, isn't the best because we want them to develop their reading skills. In Again, after the lesson has finished, they can't see the text. So we can send the handouts and materials via an email. 
if it's possible, students can print and come to the class the text. They can be work. They can be signing things, making notes. They have the material after the class is finished. However, that means more workload on you. You have to prepare all the handouts, say, the day before and send to your students. Sending it an hour before is not to do the job. We can't really see where our students are. That's the biggest disadvantage of a remote setting. We can't see where they are. But there are a lot of advantages. We can also provide our learners with links to the texts. So if you find a really, really interesting text, and that is younger learners, teenagers, learners, they can easily access the text by clicking on the link. They have control over how they maneuver through the text. They can read everything at their own pace and they have access to it after the lesson has finished. Obviously, if things can go wrong, they often will. We have to make sure that the links work. And remember that we can't really see what the students are looking at. Um, hopefully, um, I have managed to achieve the first objective. And now you see that there isn't really much difference between being receptive and environment in the face. We shouldn't be afraid of doing it. We can really develop these skills effectively, but we do need to adapt the materials and what we can do efficiently in our lesson in an online environment. Stop my to hand over to my lovely co presenter. Padam, uh, there you go. Thank you, Casa. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for joining the lesson. Uh, uh, I would like to share my screen. I think you can see now. Can everybody see? Yes, Padamji. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So I will continue from here. Uh, so we are completely talking about uh, online settings, teaching receptive skills on online settings. So when you teach uh, receptive skills online, uh, there are a couple of things to consider. And one of the things that you need to consider is uh, research shows that ESL or EFL students often struggle with reading and listening strategies. Therefore, it is crucial for us as teachers to train our students to use various types of reading and listening strategies that enable them to comprehend any type of texts. So when students listen to a text or read a text, they do it for a specific purpose. And the purpose can be to get specific information or to get a general idea of a text. Uh, the the idea of uh, skimming a, or and scanning Casa talked about earlier. So sometimes listening and reading are also done for pleasure. So the receptive skills, um, uh, many a times we think they are passive skills, but this is not the truth. This is not uh, 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 the truth. So they are very active skills. They are very active skills in the sense that both listeners and readers make use of important cognitive processing when they are listening or reading a text. There are three different approaches to understand this kind of reading process. And these three activities or that occur in mind while processing a text are top down, bottom up and interactive processes. So for the time being, what I will do is I will talk about the first two approaches. So let's begin with the top-down approach. So the top-down approach is the same in both face-to-face -face and online settings. So we have, uh, what does top-down approach mean? Top-down activities prepare students to get a general idea of a text. And 
there are some activities that you can do um, under this uh, approach and they are using pictures to guess what the topic of the text will be about. Uh, you can provide three or uh, four titles and asking the student to listen to or read the text to give an appropriate title for it. You can provide headings and asking students to match those headings with the different sectors of the different sections of the text. You can also provide different pictures to mask with uh, different sections of the text. Um, you can order a set of pictures or events as they as they appear in the text. You can ask your students to do that and listening to conversations and identifying where uh, they take place and people involved. You can do that in listening. Uh, you can uh, ask your students to infer what type of relationship between people have, uh, people involved, you know, in the conversations. You can do that um, when you um, under under top down approach. Uh, next, uh, moving on to bottom up approach. So when you teach receptive skills online, bottom up approach is also the same, like you do in face to face uh, settings. So bottom-up approach activities support our students to construct overall meaning of the text based on words, phrases, and sentences the text contains. So it's a little bit more detailed. Such activities help students to recall the information that is being processed, uh, look at antecedents, transition words, understand relationship between words, phrases, and clauses, and identify categorical and functional properties of sentence structure. So we have some, um, a couple of activities uh, that you can do under this approach. Uh, what do some of the underlined or highlighted words refer to? Or what, what or who does a pronoun refer to? Students can use annotation tool available on Zoom if you are using Zoom. Uh, whatever platform, online platform you use for your classroom. Um, identify the order of set of words in the text. You, they can, you can ask to recognize linking words or sequence markers in the text. Um, you can ask to recognize the parts of speech um, of the words, identify tense of verbs, and recognize synonyms or antonyms of specific words in the text. And you can, uh, you can ask to understand uh, basic structure of the sentences. So that's, th these are different activities that you can do under bottom-up approach in, in festival setting too. So what might be different strategies apart from those three or four uh, sobby skills that Casa talked about what might be different strategies for developing reading skills? So going back to my first point, uh, EFL or ESL students often, often struggle with uh, strategies for reading or, or listening. So, so as a teacher, how can you help or what kind of strategies do you develop uh, in your students? So the first strategy is selecting appropriate reading or listening materials. It's, it's very, very important. That's why it's in the first. Uh, so when you, when you do that, keep, mind, keep in mind the objectives of the course, uh, relevance, authenticity, uh, the student's interest, their linguistic ability, and their age. So th these, are, these are some of the things that you, that you need to keep in mind when you select a text. You can teach vocabulary item using various uh, techniques you, you as an experienced teacher, you know different types of techniques. And particularly for online teaching, um, I teach academic uh, reading and academic writing here at Minnesota State University. So what I do is my students have online apps uh, in their cell phones and I create online flashcards. There are websites you can create your, um, your flashcards online. They are, they are free. You can use that. Uh, and then predicting another tech, another strategy that you can develop in your students, uh, scheming as Casa talked about before, reading the text very quickly for the gist or for to get a general view of the text, scanning, um, um, 
reading a text very quickly to uh, quickly to find out a specific piece of information for example uh, date of birth for example uh, a specific you know number of people or something else if you are using a text from a geography relation um, previewing uh, you can do it uh, you can ask your students to do that particularly they can read through the title subtitles they can just look at the picture or read the first sentence of each paragraph just to get a kind of preview of a text that they are reading or listening. You can form questions of different types. Um, um, and then uh, you can also use text structure awareness. This is very important. For example, a text has headings, subheadings. It has different paragraphs. It has transition words. Uh, and it, 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 the text can be of different types. Uh, for example, it can be um, a compare and contrast essay. It can be an argumentative essay. So, so depending upon uh, the genre of the text, so you can do that. So some other activity, some other strategies that you can develop in your students could be summarizing. It's very, very important to recall the content that uh, the students have learned earlier. Using background knowledge, it's 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 important uh, uh, what the students already know about a particular text. Um, you can use that. Um, you can activate that as a teacher. So another one is activating schema. That's it can be linguistic schema. It can be cultural schema. It can be um, genre schema. What kind of uh, text you are you are using? So you can you can you you can do that. Locating reference in a text that could be another strategy. Uh, next one next could be recalling. Recalling another strategy that you can use. Uh, another one is evaluating. Students can evaluate author's purpose attitude, judgment, opinion, whatever um, 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 the author has in the text. You can use comprehension questions. Uh, they can be subjective questions. They can, they can be objective questions, fill in the blanks, multiple choice items, true false items, um, different types of questions. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Padamji, please okay. go ahead. And next Con strategy is inferring, making meaning of the text by reading between the lines and using personal knowledge. It also refers to constructing meaning be beyond what is literally expressed in the text. This is another uh, strategy that you can develop. Making connections. Many a times when the students read the text, they make connection to self. They make connection to other texts that they have read in the in their course book or um, in their uh, online, and then they can also connect it to the real world. So uh, this is this is making connection is also one of the important strategies. So uh, moving on to the next slide, we are coming to uh, the most important uh, um, uh, stage uh, of our presentation. Particularly, uh, we have some of the resources for you to use um, online teaching. Um, so the first uh, one is I ha we have tools or resources. Some of the tools or resources for teaching are developing reading skills uh, because completely we are thinking of online setting. So the first one is we have breaking news English. This is I found is very fascinating. The, the reason is uh, you can you can use up to date lesson materials for different levels of students based on recent news report if you use this website it consists of written scripts accompanied by lesson plans and different types of tasks to check reading comprehension vocabulary and grammar knowledge so this is really um, um, nice uh, tool uh, nice website for you um, another one is news and levels it consists of recent news stories, which are graded for different level of students. 
the audio for lower level can be can sound a little bit unnatural that's what we have found but but the written form is also available so that might be useful for your students so it's a, it's a nice resource you can you can check that for teaching receptive skills online another one is if you are teaching uh, particularly uh, young learners you, this is a nice website for you learn kids short stories video this consists of short stories and subtitles for young learners so yeah this is this is really nice and i have been using it uh, for my little uh, little one here uh, and she really enjoys the stories um, um, available in here. Another one is Cambridge Assessment English. So uh, this website do does not only have um, um, tests and uh, you know, uh, it's not only for assessment, you can also use it for developing reading skill um, and listening skill for your students. And it, this website is not only useful for the students, but also useful for teachers if they are preparing uh, for any test, uh, like internationally standard test and everything. So this is really nice resource for you. So the, these are some of the websites uh, that you can use for particularly for uh, teaching reading skills. Now, yeah, and the last one is, I found is very fascinating. You, you might be familiar with it. Uh, you might have used it many times. So when I, we were preparing uh, the session for this, uh, for this webinar, uh, we consulted this one and we found very, very uh, useful. Uh, this has teaching tips, uh, videos, lesson plans, and different types of worksheets. So the, this is a nice resource. You can use that. So moving on to uh, particularly resources for developing listening skills. So the first one, I, I this is this is the first one that we have. We we really like it. Uh, TEDx ESL. The reason is lessons are built around uh, TED talks for free. It in it includes audio, uh, written is it has written scripts and activities for different language learners. So. Uh, it has uh, so it's 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 a nice resource, uh, and we really like it, and we recommend you to use this one, uh, particularly when you are teaching listening skills. Another one is CBBS. Uh, uh, this is particularly for uh, young learners. Um, it consists of games, uh, puzzles, songs. Um, even if students can do some kind of painting, some artwork. So this is really nice resource. Uh, you can you can check uh, particularly for uh, young learners. Uh, another one is English Listening Lesson Library Online E L L L O. So this is this consists of short conversations on audio and video between people all over the world, designed for all level of students. So it has transcripts along with quizzes fill in the blanks exercises multiple choice questions and vocabulary tasks so you can you can uh, try this resource uh, particularly for listening skills and the the last one is some something different it's a, it's a nice tool it's a, it's an app that allows you to type in missing words uh, to the lyrics these days um, um, our students prefer to uh, listen to uh, music videos, you know, they love to listen to songs. So this might be very good resource for your students as well as for you. And this is uh, an app. This is available for Android and iOS. Um, you can use it. Uh, in addition, uh, when uh, I was checking about this um, um, app, I found one uh, very important article. Uh, you might be familiar with the author uh, as well. Uh, the title of the article is I have I have a link over there. You can you can check that. The title of the article is Ten Digital Tools for Developing Students' Listening Skills, and it's written by a very famous ELT expert, particularly for uh, designing online resources for teachers. Uh, many of you are familiar with it because I think we, uh, Nelta invited uh, him as a key speaker in 2019 international conference. He is Nick Piche. I think many of you are familiar with it. 
So he has uh, talked about 10 different uh, tools uh, that you can use uh, um, um, while teaching listening skills to your learner. So I recommend you to go through that article. Uh, so these are some of the uh, resources for you for teaching uh, or developing listening skills. Um, now, I would like to move to the last slide. Uh, if you remember, uh, I was talking about two different approaches before. The first one was top-down approach, and the second one was a bottom-up approach. So if you combine those two approaches, we have something called interactive approach. And this approach is also going to be the same, uh, both in face-to-face -face and online settings. The reason is uh, uh, this approach uh, gives equal importance to both bottom-up as well as top-down approaches of reading processes. Because as you, as you have seen those bottom-up and top-down activities, you see, you might have realized that uh, it's important to, de to develop both types of skills um, in, a, in, in our students. So in this approach, the students combine elements for, from both top-down and bottom-up approach for comprehending a text better. So we have some resources uh, for you. Uh, if you want to check uh, um, uh, more detailed information uh, on interactive approach. Uh, so what I would like to uh, share with you is the last quote by Mataf 1989. The best L2 readers are those who can effectively integrate both bottom-up and top-down processes. So as a teacher, what we need to do is we need to, um, we need to uh, help our students, we need to support or we need to provide resources to our students to develop these both type of, you know, skills. Uh, I mean, um, um, so that they can, they, can, um, they can be better learner or they can be um, better uh, listener or better reader. So with that, uh, I conclude here. Uh, uh, so before before uh, I go, what I would like to request and recommend uh, uh, you all is that the uh, one of the things that we need to uh, be very understanding, uh, particularly for online setting, is how our students are at home. Many a times we do not realize, realize that. And we have our own classroom constitution or classroom code of conduct in face-to-face -face class. So when you are in online setting, particularly at the time of COVID-19 or this global pandemic, we need to be a little bit understanding to our students. So the first thing that I do is I check with my students. How are they doing? How are they, their family members? And many a times, particularly when I teach international students in here, so students, you know, they will be living uh, uh, in, a, in a, they will be sharing the apartment and one student is attending online class with the teacher, another student is getting ready to go to work or another student is cooking food. So many a times we need to be very, very understanding. Sometimes technology, technology doesn't help. There might be uh, various issues with technology, power cord or uh, internet issue. Uh, so we need to be a little bit understanding, a little bit sympathetic to the student, uh, particularly in online teaching more. And another thing that you can suggest to your, to your students is that at home, there are different uh, members and some of them might be very techno friendly. For example, if I have some problem, particularly I'm not very good at technology. So I, if I have some technological issue, what I do is I consult my daughter and she is far better than me. So you can you can uh, uh, encourage your students to do that. So that's 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 my final point. And thank you very much for um, listening to me or listening to me and my friend uh, Casa. Thank you, Nelta and British Council for the opportunity. And now I will open the floor for questions if you have. Asukji, could you please help Radha? Could you please help to find the questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for for giving me uh, the chance of asking question. I had a question from Kamala Koirala. She asked the question, why listening and reading are taught in the same way? Or is the process different? Can you clarify on that? Thank you. Over to you. And there are no other questions. Uh, 
Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do that then. I'll keep my video off, perhaps, because I saw that I was breaking before. Can you hear me okay now? Now you are clear, Kasia. Yes. Okay. Better yes. off the video then. Yes, yes. Well, right. Um, as you know, we have four skills in any language learning and teaching. We've got two receptive skills, and that would be reading and listening, and two productive skills. That would be where students produce the language, um, speaking and writing. Well, both receptive skills, they're both receptive skills. This is where students receive rather than produce in reading and in listening. So basically, the principles of teaching receptive skills, reading and listening, are the same. We need to give them um, practice in developing their top-down and, and bottom-up processes. So with your top-down process, you want your students to have this, this general large view, the, ma um, the macro view of what's going on. And with the bottom-up process, it's starting from phonics, letters, vowels, syllables. These two processes, as um, Pada mentioned, they go hand in hand. We'd never do one without another, both for reading and listening. So although we'll, we might be, of course, we teach these using different materials, but the process is exactly the same. We start with an easy task in both listening and reading. We move on to a more difficult task. I, I, hope, I hope that that answers the question. Okay, we have another question from uh, Kamal Koirala. I don't see a difference between top-down and bottom-up approach. Can you clarify? I think it's okay. for Pramji. Yeah, yeah. Even you can add yes, Kasa. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, I think there is a difference between uh, top-down and bottom-up approach uh, because we are developing two different sets of skills in these approaches. So if I can go back to my slide. Uh. So so there are there are differences. There, there, as I said earlier, there are differences uh, between top-down approach and bottom-up approach, uh, because uh, when you when you use top-down approach, you are preparing your students to get a general idea of the text, and you can do these activities uh, 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 to to uh, to uh, develop uh, skills. Uh, um, of your students, receptive skills of your students. But when you do a bottom-up approach, you, you, you go a little detail, you, because with, with the bottom-up activities, the students uh, um, uh, construct overall meaning of the text that is little, uh, you know, at the deeper level. So I think uh, there is a difference between bottom-up and top-down approach, but as Kasa said earlier, they go hand, hand in hand. And uh, as a as a as a as a as an effective uh, teach, teacher, receptive skill teacher, uh, it's it's important to integrate both of them because uh, you want your students to develop both types of skills in them. And if I may just have a little very very practical example for you. For example, you talk about your friend about an evening. Okay, so you're listening to them. And really, what you're trying to understand is whether they had a good time. You want to get the overall picture, and that would be the top-down. You'd be having the top-down processes in your brain. However, if the next day you talk to the same friend, they're inviting you to your house, and they're giving you detailed directions how to get to their house, you see, you're not focusing on the overall picture here. You really tr are trying to remember oh, what's the street where's the turning and that would be bottom up um, process but really your brain subconsciously is doing both focusing on both so hopefully um that will clarify a little as well thank you Kasa. thank you for adding that 
Thank you very much, Padamji and Kasa. And there is another question from Asa Pradhan. I think, yes, she is there. And she was asking that she wrote here, what would be the easiest, what would be the easiest way to enhance writing skill? And for the grade uh, six and uh, five and six, yes. Writing skills for grade, grade five and six. What would be the easiest way to enhance writing skills? Um, writing skills would fall under the category of productive skill, and that's a yes. very, very big topic. So I think, yeah. I think that's probably a question for the next webinar because it's it. The topic is a river. <laughs> yes, yes, we yes. have as the presenter for that, and the next coming yes webinar session. Yep. So, participant, do you have any other questions? You could raise your hands or you could write on the chat box. And one question from Chandu Sarma. How can we make weak students involved more in reading activities in online class? So what do you mean? Yes. Students Chandu meaning Sarma. slower students? Yes. Uh, how can we make weak students? Yeah. Involved oh. reading activities in online. Weak means yes, slower. Yeah. Uh, can I can I can I respond and and you can add uh, Casa before after? Absolutely yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. Yes, definitely. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we do not have the same type of students in our class. Uh, students come from different backgrounds and with different abilities. Uh, one of the things that I do is when I uh, when I when I do pair work or group work, what I do is I I you know you said slow learners I I pair them with you know some kind of let's say uh, better students in terms of their academic performance you know so they can they can do it together that's what I will do for example. Uh, you know, uh, for example, if, if a student is a little bit weaker uh, in reading or in listening, then I can I can pair with another student who is good at. So that's one of the things that I do. And also, if I may add, if you have a weaker student in the class, obviously, if they're weaker and they are aware that they're weaker, if we give them large chunks of the text to read, we'll only be demotivating them. So if you've got a class of mixed ability, which is often the case, you can differentiate what you do with your students. So if you know that someone's weaker, or rather, let's say their receptive skills, um, their reading skills, they're basically slower, give them less to read, so they leave your class with a sense of achievement nonetheless. And you will gain a lot more by simply having these students motivated and they can be reading more and more, practicing their skill at home. And a very, very practical thing to do is you, you, you tell your student to read a text. They give themselves a time limit. When the timer is off and they haven't, reading, haven't finished reading, then mark in the text where they are. The second time, I guarantee there'll be probably a paragraph lower. So basically, um, give them strategies so they can practice at home, but at the same time in class, you can differentiate what you do, making sure that when they leave the class, they have achieved something. Maybe they did not read the whole text like the others, but they did read something. I hope that helps. Oh, thank you, Kasa and Padamji. Uh, many questions are related with the writing, so we are not going to take that. And one question from Jonas. Among these two receptive skills, reading and listening, which receptive skills should come first in teaching language? Listening will always come first because this is what we naturally do. We are born and the first thing we do is our ears are activated and we listen. So normally that would be listening. That's part of the communication. And once the students master the skill of forming letters, words, etc., that's when they're able to recognize this at syllable level, word level, sentence level, and that's when reading would come. Um, that's when reading would come. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Podamji, would you like to add there? 
No, perfect. That was perfect. And we'll take the last questions. There is a Karen Rai, okay. Uh, he or she, Karen asks for the questions that one problem for a student is that they read well, but do not understand the context. How can we make them read and same way understand it? Uh, I can uh, share some of my ideas. Uh, so this this is one of the one of the serious issues that often happens. So uh, in order to address that issue, what we can do is we need to uh, we need to do a lot of pre-reading activities. Uh, before we re teach that particular text, whether it is listening or reading, so you can do, you can, you can use various techniques like uh, predicting, or you can um, uh, uh, like um, uh, activating uh, background knowledge, uh, activating different types of schema. So it has to do with. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's important to prepare your students to read the text. So you, we, you, we need to do a lot of uh, pre-reading activities uh, uh, for that. Thank you, Padamji. Uh, is there anyone we can take one more? Or I think they uh, have written uh, many uh, thanks to all. Yes, uh, Bogadaji, could you please? Yeah. Anything? Yes, uh, but there is a question from Pyrrhal. Uh, can I read out the question? Yeah, please, please. please. Uh, a lot of time, even after students coming for the same level, don't have uh, same level in reality. Gets difficult to teach. It's for the mixed level. Uh, how can we handle that? Um, it's a very common situation. I'm not going to say that it's a problem, but it's a very common situation in many educational contexts. Now, um, that means there's a lot more work on the part of the teacher because we need to differentiate the material that we have. I know there's a lot of pressure on the teachers because the, obviously the, the headmasters want to see the results, the parents want to see the results. Everybody wants the results. But obviously we can't achieve the same results if we have different mixability students in the class. So... What I would say is using um, different material. Unfortunately, that means you have to work harder. But if you really, really want to help your students, um, stronger students can get more to do. You can have extra activities for the stronger students. The weaker students or the slowest students or the students um, who who are not yet there, because there's nothing stopping them to become stronger, maybe they can do slightly less in a lesson. Um, it's not an ideal situation from the point of view of um, educational establishments and assessments, but this is the only way to really make sure there's learning taking place in the classes. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Kasa. Uh, Bogandaji, any questions left now? Or shall we wrap up now? I don't see any questions. Yeah. Uh, they praise, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, wrap up. Okay. Yeah. So they all praise that. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Very fruitful and and wonderful session. Something like that. Let's go to the, okay, the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Kasa and Padamji, for your valuable and insightful sharing on teaching receptive skills in remote settings. It was a great sharing on teaching receptive skills, such as teaching reading and teaching listening in remote settings. You shared about the online and face-to-face -face teaching reading and listening, their differences and procedures, also an importance of receptive skills. In addition, you shared about the information about Teaching receptive skills involve students actively in the cognitive process. You mentioned about the various techniques and methods, top-down and bottom-up approach, 
one can use to teach receptive skills. Moreover, strategies for the developing receptive skills. Your recommendations of online resources and link are very useful to motivate children to improve their receptive skills. They were very, very informative and useful for our teachers. I hope all the participants are very, very uh, much enlightened and they are able to use, apply these methods or techniques or uh, kinds of link in virtual class for the teaching, okay, their learners. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to both presenters and congratulate for the effort and time providing a very practical session and responding all the queries. We ask our apology for the inconvenience caused during the presentation. I also would like to thank all the participants for your very interactive participation and patience and the team members from the BC and Nelta working behind the curtain for their support to make the webinar session a great success. Okay, see you all in the next webinar session on 3rd July at 4 to 5 p.m. on teaching productive skills in remote settings. Most of your many questions are related with the productive skills. So we'll see you in the next session on that. So stay at home, continue to learn all the best. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much to Kasa and Padamji. Yes, thank you.